Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the eighth uh, Sloan series uh, NYU Tandon uh, lecture in cybersecurity. Uh, my name is Nasser Memon. I'm a professor here in the computer science department, and I'm also the associate dean for online learning at Tandon, and uh, it's Tandon Online that is organizing this uh, event today in collaboration with the Center for Cybersecurity. So, in the past few decades or so, we've seen tremendous changes come about in the way we live, uh, changes caused by rapid advances in technology. Uh, the world is, in fact, getting digitized, and so is education. Uh, we are finally at the point where we are beginning to realize that digitization will help us to provide learning experiences that could be far superior to what we have done so far in the brick and mortar world. Uh, approaches like active learning, adaptive learning, mastery learning, uh, just-in-time learning, etc., which were difficult to scale before and which were difficult to execute before, seem to be easier to do with technology. And furthermore, given these rapid advances in technology, learning doesn't stop with the culmination of a degree. Learning doesn't stop with grading a credential. Uh, learning is lifelong today. And again, it's technology uh, that will allow us to provide lifelong learning experiences and make education a relationship rather than a transaction that we have in place today. And Tandon Online, uh, we have been doing this in some measure or other, and we plan to, be, plan to do more. Uh, we've been at the forefront of online education for uh, almost a decade. Uh, we started online programs way back in 2006. Uh, we offer many fully online programs, uh, masters in computer engineering, electrical engineering, cybersecurity notably, and of most interest uh, here today. Uh, we are also launching new uh, online programs, uh, especially uh, one uh, in collaboration with NYU Law, uh, titled Masters in Cyber uh, Security Risk and Strategy. It would be a unique uh, online low residency program which uh, combines courses at NYU Law School and in, in the engineering school. Uh, and we are sort of looking forward to really participating in this uh, revolution in education that is taking place today. Uh, and we're eager to partner with you uh, to help you realize your learning needs. Uh, but today we are here to talk about or to learn about the perfect storm. Uh, by perfect storm, I don't mean the movie, but the perfect storm that potentially uh, awaits us, potentially can arise due to the rapid proliferation of intelligent devices which are interconnected and the fact that they have not been designed with security in mind. Uh, and hopefully the distinguished panelists today uh, and the keynote speaker will help us allay some of these fears and show us the way as to how we can uh, sort of avoid this, this perfect storm. Uh, but I'll leave it to them. Uh, I'm eager to listen to what they have to say. Uh, but, but first, uh, I have the honor of introducing our, our first speaker, Paula Olsuski. Uh, Paula is is the program director at the Alfred, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, and we are really greatly indebted to Paula for helping us organize uh, and support the Sloan series lectures. Uh, we've been doing this for two years now, or three years, I believe. And we, we've really, it's been a very remarkable uh, success. Uh, and thanks to Paula. Uh, so Paula, as you know, uh, uh, sort of as a program director in the Sloan Foundation, and the, and the mission of the Sloan Foundation is the pursuit and promotion of the common welfare and improved American quality of life through accelerating the advance and application of scientific knowledge. And what lofty goals these are, 
and we appreciate the years of support from the foundation. Dr. Olsuski joined the Sloan Foundation as a program director in 2000. She created and directs the foundation's program in microbiology of the built environment and chemistry of the indoor environments. Dr. Olsuski led Sloan's biosecurity program until its conclusion in 2011 and the synthetic biology program until its conclusion in 2014. She also oversees the foundation's New York City initiatives program, including the Sloan Public Service Awards and the Sloan's Awards for Excellence in Teaching, Science and Mathematics. She sits on numerous advisory committees and boards, including serving as a chair of the Board of Scientific Counselors of Homeland Security Research Subcommittee at the US Environmental Protection Agency and as a board member of the Critical Path Institute. Uh, Paula received a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Yale and a Doctorate in Biological Chemistry from MIT. Uh, please welcome Paula Olszewski. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I welcome you to today's Sloan Cybersecurity Lecture. What a very interesting topic. The convergence of the Internet of Things, cloud, security, creating a perfect storm. I really look forward to Wally Ryan's presentation. I have three points that I want to uh, meant today. Uh, basically, I want to recognize all the people who've worked on this project. I want to talk to you a little bit more about the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And then I want to talk to you a bit about Sloan's work in cybersecurity and diversity. First, let's thank all of the people who have organized this lecture series. I want to start by thanking um, the Tandon School of Engineering. When we first funded this, it was called something else, but I think it's the partnership with NYU is great. In particular, Bob Ubell, who I don't think is here today, and Nasser Menem, who just spoke, and all the uh, staff and students. This is really a great effort, and I think it's a very valuable lecture series. All right, so on to the Sloan Foundation. Alfred P. Sloan, Jr. started the foundation in 1934. It was quite a while ago. Our mission is to, pour, is to support research and education in science, technology, and economics with a strong commitment to diversity. We also are focused on, again, these program areas, these themes, but how it will impact the quality of American life. The foundation is small and nimble. Grant making must be early or catalytic or both. Our endowment is less than $2 billion. We have a very small staff, about 32 people. There are seven people at the foundation who direct grant making, such as myself, and we generally have two or three active program areas. For those of you who know anything about endowments, um, if we have less than $2 billion, that means we give away less than 5% of $2 billion or $100 million a year, again, spread over many, many programs. Uh, you may have heard about some of our work, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the Sloan Research Fellowships. We support lots of shows on NPR and PBS. Mr. Sloan was from Brooklyn. He grew up right around here, and the foundation is in Manhattan. So we have a civic program to provide grants in New York City that fit with our mission. So our work in cybersecurity is as a civic initiative. We do not have a program in cybersecurity. It's all part of our interest in helping make New York City stronger and better. That said, I tried, I looked at having a program in cybersecurity and it just seemed a little bit bigger and broader than the scope of programs we usually support. But we know it's a big issue. It's a bigger part of the field of IT, computing, and there are big problems in the field. And one big issue is the workforce. Where are the women? Where are the underrepresented minorities? If the pipeline is leaking, 
it's not the fault of the people in the pipeline. I'm uh, proud to say that we have supported here at the Tandon School of Engineering a uh, summer computer science for cybersecurity program for high school women. And I've met with these students. These are, to get into the program, you need all sorts of advanced high school math. They came from diverse backgrounds from all over the region, and they were brilliant, they were enthusiastic, and this was their first, in many cases, first um, um, interaction with cybersecurity, computer science, and so on. So I hope these accomplished young women will be welcomed and inspired by this field and not driven out of it. But I'm cautiously optimistic, based on many of the conversations I've had this morning, that there are many people in this room who recognize that increasing diversity in terms of women and underrepresented groups in the field of cybersecurity will help us solve the problem. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, your continued leadership and support of the Sloan Foundation is truly appreciated. I am uh, Ramesh Kari. I am a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at the NYU Tandon and co-founder of the NYU Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, everything in our modern world runs on computers which means everything is vulnerable to hackers. Cell phones, elevators, cars, airplanes, you can imagine whatever. So we, we have a global interdisciplinary collaboration among NYU schools to tackle these uh, current risks in cybersecurity and working to secure the future of society in ways that few others have even dreamed. Uh, the NYU CCS, or Center for Cybersecurity, focuses on all levels of the problem. Hardware, software, networks, human psychology, and societal issues of business, law, and policy. Computer chips are the foundation, and we are proud to play a leading role in this emerging security field. Our CCS researchers are literally securing the electronic supply chain which snakes across the globe from supplier to supplier for design, prototyping, and fabrication. We develop tools invaluable to forensic investigators, our techniques for recovering deleted digital images camer from cameras and computers are used by law enforcement agencies around the world. Our researchers protect your privacy, we showed that individuals who believe they are post posting on anonymous social media can in fact be identified when information from multiple accounts on multiple websites is compared and collated. Meanwhile, at the School of Law, we are studying and writing about corporate malfeasance, such as Volkswagen's uh, manipulation of emission tests. At NYU Tandon, we are working with auto industry to secure software uploads critical to these self-driving cars. These are some of, our ex some of the examples. So NYU CCS is unique among the cybersecurity centers in four ways. We have a strong interdisciplinary program rooted in cybersecurity technology. And at NYU, cybersecurity is a global scale effort. CCS has a strong presence in the Middle East with NYU Abu Dhabi as our beachhead this helps us understand important attacks before they come to our shores and offers a cultural perspective on cybersecurity. Three, NYU was among the first to offer university level courses in cybersecurity as well as summer programs for high school and college students, teachers, and initiatives to bring girls and women into STEM fields. The NYU Cyber Scholars Program has placed alumni throughout the US government and industry. Our interdisciplinary program has won a trifecta of accolades from the NSA for excellence in cybersecurity education, for excellence in cybersecurity research, and for excellence in creating courses with hands-on white hat hacking labs. Most importantly, NYU CCS outreach program is exceptional, we think. NYU CCS Cybersecurity Awareness Week is the largest 
student-run cybersecurity outreach event in the world. This year, it will be held simultaneously in North America, Europe, Israel, India, and the Middle East. We have a uh, seesaw attracts 20,000 participants every year competing in the capture the flag, capture the chip, chip forensics, best paper award, and so on and so forth. With that background, I am honored to introduce today's keynote speaker, Walden Wally C. Rines, the chairman and CEO of Mentor Graphics. I am especially excited because the basis of his conversation with us today will be on hardware security, my area of research and interest, and dare say, my area of expertise. Uh, before Wally comes up, let me say a few things about him. Walden Rines is chairman and executive officer of Mentor Graphics, a leader in worldwide electronic design automation. During his tenure at Mentor Graphics, revenue has nearly quadrupled, and Mentor has grown the industry's number one market share solutions in four of the 10 largest segments of the EDA industry, EDA industry. He joined Mentor in 1993 from Texas Instruments, where he was most recently executive vice president in charge of TI's semiconductor business. Rhines has served five terms as chair of the Electronic Design Automation Consortium. He's also a board member of the Semiconductor Research Corporation and First Growth Children and Family Charities. He received a BSEE degree from University of Michigan, an MS and PhD from Stanford University, an MBA from Southern Methodist University. I'd like to welcome Wally to stage and also Paula to stage and invite Nasser to join us as we present uh, uh, this year's Distinguished Sloan Lecture Award first. And, uh, Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Can I give that temporarily? Give that to you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, Paula. Uh, and thank you, all of you here and for NYU. Uh, I'm very pleased to come today because it's a topic of great interest to me, having spent my life in the semiconductor industry, and we're going to talk about chips integrated circuits, silicon, and their relationship to what is a large and growing field of interest, the Internet of Things. Now, for the future, we all know that we will have billions of electronic devices that are sensing things and sending information. And it changes our lives and creates many opportunities for business. The fact that you can have a uh, uh, your lawn know when it needs to be watered and go ahead and water it. Or you can have information sent to you that you don't have to look for. Or the camera on your security system allows you to access what's going on in your home when you're not there. But in fact, what you really don't want is for other people to have that same access. And so the Internet of Things gets lots of publicity. If you just look at recent years, Five, six years ago, the number of articles where the prime keyword was Internet of Things was really negligible. And yet, today, last year, 70,000 articles written about the Internet of Things. A growing awareness, in fact, so growing that you could attend Internet of Things conferences half the days of the year if you chose. And on April 9th of just recently, we had the Internet of Things Day, which had 58 conference-like events simultaneously around the world 
for all of you who want to hear more about a subject you already hear a great deal of. But at the same time, there is a great deal of publicity on the counterpart of those benefits of the Internet of Things, and that's cybersecurity. It's followed a similar path and now has more article sightings than the Internet of Things at over 100,000 last year. And it used to be when the number was small, so were the number of articles primarily based around the computer infrastructure we had with Windows-based personal computers and other traditional computing, but it's changed. And one of the things that has changed it a great deal are consumer smart devices, devices that could communicate wirelessly or maybe not wirelessly, but become hackable. And so the numbers have grown dramatically. And so together, as we uh, deploy the semiconductors required, we worry more and more about the cybersecurity. And this takes us to what's already referred to by Ramesh, uh, something that's known as Beckstrom's Law. Beckstrom's Law of Cybersecurity states that anything attached to a network can be hacked. Everything is being attached to networks. In there, through very simple logic, it then says that everything can be hacked. So it's a game between the hackers and the defenders that's uh, ensuing and creating a lot of opportunity and a lot of innovation. So this has been going on a while, and uh, if you'd like to get involved in the sport, there is the Black Hat Conference held every July in Las Vegas. And it used to be that you could easily tell who was representing who. That is, you had the black hats who you could tell mostly by the number of piercings and tattoos, and you had the white hats from the suits and the ties. But it's become very confused because now we have hobbyists, we have students, we have all sorts of people going to black hat who just want to learn the latest technology, they want to know the challenges, they want to know how to defend their systems. And black hat is actually the outgrowth of an even bigger and a more secretive conference called DEF CON, which also occurs in Las Vegas. This one is 25 years old, been going on a long time, but this is where the real pros go. This is one where if you would like to attend, uh, do not expect to pay the registration fee with a credit card. They don't take credit cards. <laughs> they also don't take checks, traveler's checks, or any other instrument that can be traced. You pay in cash. And they recommend you do not take your cell phone into the meeting because it will be hacked as well. And a couple of years ago, they had a famous demonstration with standard ATM machines and timed the best experts on how long it took for them to get those machines to start spitting out $20 bills. I mean, these people are real pros. And they hack everything from solar panels to electronic wheelchairs. They come in with the latest techniques. And this is one where if you get really serious about it, it's where you find the key people. Well, every year we hear about new notable breaches of security. They cause a lot of problems. Uh, back in 2013, we had the Associated Press's Twitter account was hacked did an announcement, a uh, false news report that, that caused stock prices to fall by almost $140 billion. We had a major breach in South Korea, 104 million credit card records, uh, and as a result, the executives resigned, as they seem to do in Asia. Maybe we should think about that as a technique in the US. Uh, the Syrian Electronic Army hacked Forbes, uh, an account, uh, and compromised a million accounts. Anthem, the health insurer, uh, recently, 2015, uh, gained access to 80 million customer records. And if you think that your tax return is secure, think again. The IRS uh, is believed to have been uh, compromised for 724,000 US taxpayers. A serious problem for all of us. There are people who keep track of how many data breaches are actually reported. And the known ones last year were 1,378,000 records were compromised as a result of hacking. Most of those are done for identity theft, but a large share for other types of financial access. And most of them are done by malicious outsiders 
but increasingly there are all sorts of other reasons for the hacking to occur, and partly because systems in place were not designed with the intent to protect against hackers. One of the most famous was the Stuxnet virus. Many of you have read about it, uh, believed to have come from Israel. Uh, very clever, uh, made its way into Iran and is believed to have compromised 14 different industrial sites that were working on nuclear programs. Now it got in, it's a very small one, 500 kilobytes, came in through personal computers and made its way into the programmable logic controllers of the equipment used in the facilities and is believed to have been able to cause their centrifuges, which were enriching the uranium, to self-destruct and to have substantially delayed the nuclear development program of Iran. Well, uh, you wonder, how did they get in there? Uh, now, we don't know how they got in, but we do know that it's not that hard. There was a test run by the Department of Homeland Security where they sprinkled thumb drives, USB flash drives, in the parking lot. Some of them had US uh, Department of Homeland Security logos, some did not. For the total, 60% of those were picked up and eventually plugged into personal computers, thus potentially infecting them. And the interesting part is that 90% of those with the logos were plugged into computers. So yes, you may need to have devious spies go in and plant your virus, but actually it's not that hard. Your own employees can help you if that's your objective. Other cases, the Syrian radar case is interesting to semiconductor people because it's believed to have been a Trojan that infected a standard microprocessor part, a part from a commercial vendor which was designed into a state-of-the-art radar system that was used in Syria. And as a result, because it had a Trojan hidden within the chip, the Israelis were able to remotely turn off the radar for a couple hours while they had a bombing attack and then turn it back on afterwards. Really impressive technology. The Jeep Cherokee hack. Many of you may have seen this on 60 Minutes. Uh, this one, pretty remarkable. In fact, one of the uh, worst cases of uh, corporate uh, public relations embarrassment exceeded only by United Airlines dragging passengers off the airplane. Uh, and in this case, uh, they were able to come in through what's called the CAN bus, uh, the control area network that is in most cars. And so it's a set of electrical connections. It turns out the entertainment systems are all connected to the CAN bus. And uh, until recently, so were all the other systems. And so the hackers were able to come in through the entertainment infotainment system and get control of the steering, the transmission, the brakes, and therefore take over control of the car, pretty scary. But what's even scarier is that Chrysler, who owns Jeep, chose to patch the problem with a software change, and they sent it out through the mail on USB drives. Not a very secure way to distribute a patch. So when we look at the future of cars uh, and other vehicles like that, there are really two things that are going to have to happen. One is mission critical systems like braking and steering and so forth are going to have to be physically separated from infotainment and other electronic systems and also protected from wireless uh, connectivity problems. But even with that, a high-end car today has over 100 million lines of software code in it. There is no way you can write 100 million lines of code and not have a vulnerability, regardless of what people tell you. So the important thing beyond that is that you have a way to patch and patch quickly. One of the companies that actually has that ability today is Tesla. Tesla actually can do a complete download of their entire installed base of vehicles in less than 24 hours and make major changes to the operating parameters of those vehicles. And they, in fact, uh, made a surprise appearance at DEF CON uh, uh, just a year ago, where the group in one of the panels was demonstrating how they had hacked the Tesla and gotten through the security. And at the end of their presentation, 
A man got up in the audience, introduced himself as the chief technical officer of Tesla. He then presented $10,000 checks to the hackers as their reward for finding a breach in the system. And then he announced that Tesla had already issued the patch, downloaded it, and fixed the problem, and was very, very open about it. Well, sometimes it's not so insidious. They're not trying to take over your car and drive it somewhere or run it off the road. Uh, I actually uh, am familiar with a person who informed me that uh, he just didn't have the money to buy the expensive Audi, and so he bought the Audi S4 for $25,000. Nice car, but not as nice as the Audi RS4, which cost $40,000. Now, if you look at the specification, you'll notice the engine is the same. 4.2 liter V8, dual overhead cam, exactly the same, all-wheel drive. What makes these two cars so different that one is worth $25,000 and one is worth $40,000? Largely, the gear ratios, the horsepower achieved, and it's all embedded in firmware that is in programmable uh, memory and logic in the vehicle if you can hack through. He, of course, being a talented person, did hack through and turned his $25,000 car into a $40,000 car. Quite innovative uh, and not quite so damaging as what people were doing with the Jeep. Well, all of this can be minor or it can be major. And major means really major. The entire power grid is subject to hacking. The banking system, all of our transportation, national defense, medical and health care, very serious consequences if people are able to freely access this information. And the chips are the root of trust for all of these systems, which are largely controlled electronically. So let's take a look at vulnerability, starting at the highest level and going all the way down to the hardware itself in the silicon chips. At the top level, we have users. That's all of us. We've been subject to phishing expeditions where you get a virus on your computer, it's very irritating, causes problems, but you can get rid of it, you can fix the problem, uh, you can buy uh, uh, software that will make your computer resistant. So the relative impact, while annoying, is not enormous. You get into application software and now we're starting to get serious. And I can assure you that Microsoft has a vast team of people who do nothing but monitor intrusions into products like Microsoft Word or other applications where if viruses get in, they spread to a very large base of people and they're more difficult to get out than a, a typical uh, phishing expedition which probably has an email that you clicked on uh, suggesting that you wire money to a bank or something. Operating systems, though, are at the heart of the computer. They are what give the computer its instructions to operate. And if you get down to the operating system now, you've got something that, one, is very difficult to remove or detect, and number two, affects millions, in fact, hundreds of millions or even billions of people around the world and potentially gets you in at a level where you can do real damage. And then ultimately, at the bottom of this hierarchy, the one you almost never hear about is the hardware itself. It's the chips. People trust silicon chips that they're not going to do something they're not supposed to do. And yet, this is the next frontier. This is where the innovators today are pushing the technology. And you'll hear today from panelists who have a great deal of experience in what is being done, what can be done to defend, and where this is likely to go in the future. Well, I've searched the internet for instances of embedded Trojans in silicon or hardware that isn't reliable. And I have found one case. Dell Computer actually warned that there was a Trojan embedded in the motherboard of a particular model of their computer. They announced it, they recalled them, exchanged them, and it all went away. Uh, overall, if you search around for it, you will not find many reports of Trojans or viruses or other things that are in basic silicon. But every time I meet with people in Washington or in the defense industry and so on, and I say, you know, this doesn't really look like a problem to me, you know, they just roll their eyes back and they say, how can this guy be so naive? 
And I've finally concluded, I have no evidence, but I suspect that our government has been doing it to the bad countries for a long time, so we assume they can do it to us. And they probably are doing it to us, and people are very worried about what could happen. Nevertheless, not that much money is being spent down at the physical level, about 11% of IT spending to control, defend, look into the security associated with the hardware. Most of it is spent up here with network security, data security, and other things because they are so visible. They are what are publicized as causing the problems today. Well, I'm going to talk about three different areas of, uh, of the uh, emergence of risk in silicon, but first, the challenge for people who design chips today is that if you allow people or if it is possible to design in Trojans or viruses or other things in chips, then the rest of the system is defenseless. It's already there. I represent an industry now, although I've spent half my career in the semiconductor industry with Texas Instruments, but for the last 20 years or so, I've been in electronic design automation. And what electronic design automation provides are the computer-based tools to design electronics, particularly integrated circuits, but also printed circuit boards and even systems. And the primary thing that that software does, in addition to allowing you to create the blocks of electronics, is to verify that the chip or the system does what it is supposed to do. You have requirements and you verify against it. Now think about this, they, there are, it's routine today to have chips with billions of transistors on them. And so the logic of those chips and the memories are very complex, very large, and so it takes hundreds of thousands or millions of hours of verification on the biggest computers we have today just to verify that the chips do in fact do what they're supposed to do. And it's actually miraculous to many of us that in fact frequently the chips that come out of a, uh, the first run of a product end up being fully functional and doing everything they're supposed to do. It's not that unusual, roughly 50% of the time that's what happens. Now, it's a tough problem, but if you think that problem is tough, think about the problem we now face and that is verifying that the chip does nothing that it is not supposed to do. This is a much bigger problem. This is a defined space of verification. This one is undefined, and that's why it's so exciting in terms of new challenges, new opportunities, new business, but it also is very frustrating because the techniques used to verify this side are not necessarily the same as those that are verifying that you're not doing anything that you don't want the computer or the chip to do. So we'll talk about three areas. One are side channel attacks. Now, these are basically uh, attacks that try to get information out of a chip, and typically they are passive. They, they don't destroy the chip, although there are techniques where you can, in fact, inject uh, uh, oh, either radio frequency or lasers or other information. But in general, you can think about these like you would think about a safe cracker of days of old with a stethoscope, turning the dial on the safe, listening for the tumblers to fall, and figuring out what's the combination to the safe. Well, this is the same kind of thing. It's just the techniques are different. We use high tech. And now the two most common are thermal and uh, radio frequency. So with thermal, what you're doing is looking at power dissipation on the silicon itself, and the chip heats up in the portion that is most active. Uh, with the electromagnetic, you're analyzing the radio frequency emissions and uh, trying to determine what is, for example, the pin in the credit card chip you have. So what you do is you do thermal analysis. You look within the chip, you look for the peaks, you're looking for that area where it's decoding the pin. And when you do that, you find that somewhere on that chip is the pin that is stored in the chip that you're trying to match. You enter a bunch of other alternative pins and you see if you can infer what the pin actually is in the chip. So a passive uh, side channel attack. 
Now you say, hey, going after credit cards, you know, this is, that's a pretty tedious way to make money. Uh, and even if you do RF and automate it, it's still pretty tedious. So there are other things that generate even more money faster. One of those is entertainment. Most of us pay a lot of money for our monthly bill for all of the, uh, the sports and entertainment we get. And so we have set-top boxes that we use with the cable company or the, the dish satellite, whatever. And those have very sophisticated encryption so they know whether you have purchased the particular shows that you, in fact, want to watch. And that's controlled well. And the people who design those set-top boxes uh, are quite sophisticated. And we have met with them and talked to them. And the way they measure the quality of their work is how long it takes from the time they issue a new set-top box until the hacked version shows up on eBay. 12 to 18 months is a really good design. And then you go on eBay, you buy the set-top box, and as a result, you get to watch the programs for free if you don't mind being a thief. Uh, anyway, uh, it happens. Another one, uh, cell phones. Uh, you may have heard that Mark Zuckerberg puts tape over the cameras on his PC. Uh, uh, you might do well to do the same on your cell phone because people can get in, they can hack it, they can see what you're doing, they can even infer entries of uh, keys within on the keyboard uh, just doing it remotely. And you say, hmm, this probably is pretty rare. It's not pretty rare. In fact, I was at a conference where they ask everyone to take out their cell phones and look at the amount of memory that their flashlight application occupied. What they said was, if it's more than 100 K bytes, it is doing something other than turning on the flashlight. Well, I got out mine, it was 20 megabytes. <laughs> so I figure everything on my cell phone is on some server in China now, and they have complete access. Well. Uh, what do you do about solving this problem? Uh, what the chip designers are doing is try to improve what's called the signal to noise ratio, that is, so it doesn't emit the signal so much so the RF detection won't see it, or put randomness into the cryptography, or move the pin device in separate pieces around the chip, uh, camouflaging structures so you can't reverse engineer the layout, uh, creating algorithms that are fixed time so they don't have greater delay for one number than for another, and a variety of techniques. But this is one where no sooner do the chip designers come up with a new approach that the hackers figure it out, so you have to move. And typically, for the credit card chips, they introduce new algorithms about every 12 to 18 months as well. Well, the second thing are counterfeit chips. And you say, counterfeit? What do you mean? Counterfeit chips? I mean, I understand. Currency counterfeiting, that's reasonable. Even wine labels, I worry about that when I buy wine, is, to, is this a counterfeit? But chips? My, you think this is pretty rare, pretty hard to do? It's not rare at all. In fact, it's a big business. So the electronics industry, all electronic equipment, is about $2.6 trillion per year. And of that, about 16% is semiconductors. Comes out to around $350 billion per year. So if you can sell counterfeits, then you can make a lot of money. Well, in fact, most people don't even know it occurs, and yet counterfeit uh, components which are presumed to be a one in a million chance, in fact, are much more likely, some distributors have reported as much as 35% of their incoming product at times turned out to be counterfeit. Most people believe that only bad distributors sell counterfeit parts. In fact, most counterfeit parts are sold by fully authorized legitimate distributors. And most people think only expensive components, 50 or $100 microprocessors uh, are counterfeit, but in fact, 60% are $10 or less. And uh, most people think you can detect the counterfeits, but in fact, a very large share, more than half, cannot in fact be detected because they may just be marginal parts or they may be legitimate parts that are used. If you look at reported cases of counterfeiting, you find that it's been increasing. This goes back to 2009, and you can see the trend. And this is reported cases. We don't 
know all cases. And so the trend is upward. And one of the principal reasons that counterfeits show up is that semiconductor manufacturers will discontinue manufacturing of a part. We had a great deal of this back in 2009 for two reasons. One, having been in the chip business, I recognize that uh, one of the ways you can raise money in tough economic times is to discontinue a product and offer a lifetime buy, sell all your inventory and create some revenue, and then it's discontinued, and then it has the secondary benefit. You don't have to stock that part anymore. The volume wasn't very big anyway. It's a pretty old part. And so that part's discontinued, and now the people who need to buy it, if they didn't buy enough in the lifetime buy, they go to the gray market distributors. And guess who they are? They are typically the defense industry that has planes and tanks that were designed 20, 30 years ago, but they have no choice. They have to get the parts. They get those parts, but they really don't know where the parts came from. Uh, in fact, it's very tough to control because the chip industry is a multinational industry. Typically, integrated circuits are designed in one place. They're sent frequently to a foundry or a manufacturing facility somewhere else, frequently in Asia or offshore, uh, to a wafer fab to be processed. Then they go to a place where they assemble them and test them, typically places like uh, Malaysia or uh, uh, other parts of Asia, the Philippines, a very popular place. And then eventually they make their way back to either to the end user or to the provider. So by the time they're there, they should have lots of frequent flyer miles. Well, the problem is that each stage there is subject to someone doing something they're not supposed to do. Uh, for example, the assembly sites for years have been known for aggressively bidding contracts for assembly, but on Sunday when the plant was supposed to be closed, they ran a little extra production that made its way into the gray market, or they uh, uh, simply took the reject bins, the parts that failed, or maybe didn't fail completely, but partially, and those parts made their way into the market and therefore, you have counterfeits that can be a real problem. Now, there is a problem that has been, uh, oh dear, got this again, problem brought on by ourselves. Wow. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, let's see. Once again. Okay, we'll try again. I think I have been hacked, yes. Uh, so, the problem, if I can get to it. Okay. Hmm. You have the backup? I don't know, it's just freezing up. But now I've lost control of the... Uh, Cursor. Because your cursor's on the other screen. It is? Oh, how Bring interesting. There it is. We're ready to go? Yeah. So we're further down. So the uh, there are regulations. So we should be right there. Is it your, is it your uh, thing that could be? I don't know. Could be. This one, okay. Okay, so there are regulations that have been introduced for the disposal of computer equipment. Uh, after all, computers contain lead and other things, and so to dispose of them, you can't just throw them in the trash can. You have to dispose of them in an environmentally sound way, and so you sell them to a disposal company that typically ships them offshore and then uh, takes all the noxious materials and disposes of them responsibly, or so you think. But in fact, they have lots of low-paid workers, and these computers that have been used for 20 years have chips that can be taken out, they can be cleaned up, and they look just like new, and they can show up in the market as new chips, even though they are used. Well, take a look here. Let's, uh, let's try. Which one do you think is the counterfeit? These are chips from Cypress Semiconductor. Uh, they have, how many of you uh, think this is the counterfeit? Okay, how many of you think this is the counterfeit? 
Okay, so we have people on both sides. Uh, here it is, uh, the counterfeit. Uh, the one on the left, notice the perfect symbolization. It's all parallel and straight. The actual legitimate chip, it's sort of crooked and smeared. The fact is, it's impossible to tell which is the counterfeit. The problem is, if you can detect it at incoming, you're OK. But if it gets all the way into the end product, as it does in these two sections of the chart, then you have a problem, and maybe you have a product recall. Well, traditionally, what we've done is have a way to track the chips through all these locations it goes to. And we have uh, proof of traceability, which, as long as everybody's honest in the chain, has sort of worked. But it can't be trusted anymore. And so people keep developing new techniques. And very sophisticated technology. Lots of the panelists have been involved in these things. Military systems in particular have used uh, physically unclonable functions, PUFFs, where you take the signature of the chip itself, a, a memory on the chip. When you first power it up, will come up with ones and zeros sort of randomly, but predictably. And you can use that information to identify that particular chip. But there are vulnerabilities, and the other part is it costs money. And a lot of people don't want to pay the money. Customers don't want to pay the money. They don't believe cybersecurity in the form of silicon is a risk. And so they opt for the cheap approach, and they go without the security. Now, there are a lot of techniques being proposed. Uh, one developed by DARPA called the Shield it embeds a very intelligent chip in the package itself and provides uh, encrypted uh, traceability that that chip is authentic. But remember, that doesn't protect you, for example, from the recycling I mentioned. Uh, that still can't be identified, so you need other things. So some that have been proposed, I'm not aware of many people doing it yet, but probably will, are on-chip odometers that simply count the number of cycles, encrypt the information, and therefore you can tell this chip is a used chip or it's not. Activation's another approach where you simply don't activate the chips until they go into use, and you do that by having programmable codes that allow you to reserve activation until after manufacturing is completed. Well, there are some new ones coming on the market. And once again, every time the hackers get more clever, the designers get more clever. And the latest one is they take a design. These are logic gates, uh, Boolean operators. And what they do is they purposely disguise them so they look like different logic than they are. And they insert them and fill them throughout any of the empty space in the chip so that you are effectively camouflaging this and then if you really want to be sophisticated, then at the time manufacturing is completed and you receive the chips back from the assembler, then you enter an encryption code which activates the actual gates that are going to be used in the design. Pretty clever and pretty hard to reverse engineer. Uh, there are other things also uh, increasingly in development or uh, considered. One is what we call the root of trust, putting a fingerprint, in essence, on the chip, enrolling it with a server that you trust, once again, an issue. But uh, anyway, having it at the time of manufacture, and then you configure and activate in the assembly process. And then you can use the identity code to turn portions of the chip on or off or change its functionality and therefore protect yourself. Well, the last one is malicious logic inside the chip. And this one is really insidious. How do you, in fact, do you defend against this or even know that it's present? The way this works is someone injects rogue hardware into the design. And it can be triggered remotely, or uh, it can be uh, used uh, to activate at a specific time, and it can uh, cause the system to stop working, very important if you're a jet engine or something, or they can uh, simply covertly access information on the chip and transmit it elsewhere. Well, in the whole process of designing a chip, there are many places that are vulnerable. Because you start with the requirements, and you start writing code, and you program it, and it goes all the way down to routing the chip and the final layout verification. But the most vulnerable today is a result 
of productivity increases that have occurred in the last 10 years. And that is, people don't design chips from the ground up anymore. They reuse blocks of what's referred to as IP or intellectual property, but basically reuse blocks of circuitry in a design. And now chips have 50, 60, 70 percent are reused from other designs. Where did they get those other designs? Well, sometimes off the internet, sometimes from an IP supplier, uh, sometimes you don't even know because that particular block has been enhanced and, and worked on by many different people. So it's very tough to control that chain. And it's also very tough to detect it when it exists within your chip. Well, there are some things that people will be able to do. Still in its infancy, but one way is to embed a processor on the chip. An extra processor that has nothing to do with the functionality of the chip but it simply monitors all the electrical signals and looks for unusual situations. You can think of this like if you were in a helicopter looking at the highway system and all of a sudden you know, 60 red cars entered the highway at the same time, you'd say, hmm, there's something very strange about that I should investigate. And what this does is monitor uh, operating codes for instructions, uh, uh, particular memory accesses and so on, and tries to discern if something unusual is going on. Well, to summarize, as we said, there are many levels of the hierarchy of uh, cybersecurity, but particularly for silicon, the IoT offers one of the broadest because chips are used so broadly and with the Internet of Things, we're going to have billions of them spread around. So, we have emerging demand for silicon authentication in medical applications as well as in military and safety applications, and there people are taking security quite seriously. We also have new standards coming to market. 26262 is the new automotive standard, and it has a lot in it about security of the electronics in a car, and there are similar ones for aviation, rails, and other things. But ultimately, I think something is going to happen. And since suppliers in general are not spending the money it takes to make their silicon secure, sooner or later, there is going to be a problem. And that problem is going to cost someone a lot of money, or worse yet, cause personal injury. When that occurs, awareness will arise. And when that awareness arises, the people who buy chips will go to their suppliers, the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers who are building cars, planes, trains, whatever, uh, cell phones. They'll go to their chip suppliers and they'll say, oh, by the way, we've heard about this problem. We would uh, like you to just add this line to your purchase order which says you certify that there are no embedded Trojans, viruses, or anything else in your chips. And the supplier wants to sell chips and so says, okay, well, that sounds reasonable, and goes and talks to what do you mean? Just lawyer. The lawyer says, you have to be crazy. We are not going to guarantee that it has nothing in it because we can't prove it has nothing in it. And that will touch off what I think will be the solution we live with over time, which is everyone will be moving toward best practices, trying to determine what is the best practice to guarantee security, but it's never guaranteed. It's only I've used the best practice, so I've minimized the risk, so maybe someone will go after someone else's chips instead of my own. Thank you. We will take questions from the audience or online as you like. Uh, great lecture, thank you. Uh, you have, I suspect, much cloud-based software at Mentor. Uh, much what? You have much cloud-based software. What does Mentor do to protect that cloud-based software? Because once a bug gets into your software, uh, I call it the Moore's Law of Software, it's going to multiply at a dramatic rate. Uh, and in, in fact, thousands of your of your uh, purchasers and so on. So you, you're touching on several issues. The question is with regard to the effect of the cloud on the software used to design those chips. 
Uh, of course, the easy answer is, well, you can certainly trust us. I mean, we are your tool supplier. But the fact is, you should trust no one. Uh, but interestingly, one of the reasons that cloud-based electronic design automation software has not generated any significant revenue is that our customers don't trust the cloud. They trust the cloud with their bank accounts, they trust the cloud with their securities accounts, but they don't trust the cloud with their design information. So most of our customers, probably better than 90%, insist upon having their own isolated servers, or in certain cases, they will trust us to be their cloud, but we have to prove a secure connection where they uh, actually interact with us. And the amount of sales in our industry for cloud-based applications is quite small, but I expect over time, because things like uh, Amazon and Microsoft uh, cloud services are getting to the point where they, they have better security than the average company that's designing the chips, that with time it will move to the cloud, but it is a risk, because if you can inject it in the design software, then you can inject it in the chip and you'll be vulnerable. So uh, it's something that will become a problem, but isn't a major problem today. Question? Uh, a lot of the uh, IoT today is driven by open, the open source hardware and software movement. Uh, how do you secure open source hardware, open source software, when all of the chip designs are uh, you know, on the internet and all of the software to run that, those chips are on the internet? So uh, questions with regard to open source. And in fact, uh, we are purveyors of open source. We have 35 reviewers and committers within our company in the open source community. And the fact is, it's very difficult to control. Uh, we do keep track of any place in our software that open source code makes its way. And so we can find it, we can monitor it, but protecting against it, even with the open source community uh, having lots of activity to try to control it, uh, open source is a vulnerability for design information that is very difficult to control. And it's the reason a lot of companies forbid the use of open source in their design flows. How do ordinary consumers who love their iPhones and want to control their thermostat, their front door, as well as start their car, how do, how do we protect ourselves? So what about the ordinary consumer? What can you do about this? Uh, the answer is there are some basic things you ought to do. You ought to follow procedures for your passwords and keeping them up to date and uh, being careful about things and the information that you put onto a cell phone or personal computer and other things. But ultimately, you are vulnerable to your suppliers and to the people you buy software from. So you can be careful about what you download. You can be careful about what you click on. Uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, suppliers that are reputable are probably lower risk. Uh, but uh, nobody is foolproof. Yes. The, we're talking about open source and IoT and vulnerabilities of hardware, but the number of problems with IoT have overwhelmingly been in the applications layer of the device. The fact is that of that, I think it was 10,000 articles we were talking about, or 100,000 articles we were talking about, the overwhelming majority of them are probably manufacturing hooks left in, obvious passwords, unencrypted communications, dot, dot, dot. This is not operating systems layer. This is stupid applications. And will probably continue to be so. It's much easier. As a nation state can invest in hacking hardware and possibly justify it, a hacker in the corner, even a criminal ring with substantial funding, it's still a capex that people are not going to be able to swallow. It's cheaper to whack the applications layer and the, so or the source tree leading to the applications layer to be complete. You are absolutely right. So the applications layer is where the greatest, uh, the ease of entry is easiest. It's where most of the publicized problems occur. And as I showed you, it's where most of the money is spent there and in the network and the data in order to prevent it because it is the easiest entry. But that's really what makes the silicon uh, so scary because, as you say, 
nation states can fund the kinds of development required to get into the silicon itself. And the payback is large, as I showed in some of my examples. The, uh, the awareness of the problem in silicon is not, uh, is not great compared to the awareness of things at the application layer, so it doesn't get much attention. So if you really want to do some harm, the silicon is a good place to go because nobody is watching. It's sort of like uh, the advertisements for the club to lock your steering wheel. Does that actually prevent theft? Well, it just means that somebody, someone who wants to steal a car will steal somebody else's instead of yours. Same thing uh, is true here. In general, if you can get into the operating system, that's easier than getting into the silicon. But there are people who will get into the silicon. And once they do, they can do a lot more damage. Yes. Um, so it seems like there's a big economic problem here, right? That if you delay shipping your product, your company might not exist. Whereas if you invest in security, well, that's going to be a problem years down the road. So what can we as an industry do to sort of change the economics to make security actually valuable? As I mentioned, the, one of the reasons that the existing state of the art is not used is because customers won't pay for it. They don't believe it's a big problem, or even if they do believe it, their customers are not telling them, I will pay you extra for your chip if it has security in it. Which is why I think, ultimately, no matter how much we talk about it, ultimately it's going to take a well-publicized incident for people to start becoming aware. And once they do, then I think they'll become really aware. And then the people who buy chips will be willing to pay for state-of-the-art uh, protection capabilities as compared to the average run-of-the-mill chip that has none of those embedded. Okay, one more? Okay. Ratio B for uh, vulnerability is introduced in the design process versus what the supply chain kind of brings in, like the maliciousness from there. That's a good question because historically we've worried about manufacturing as introducing all the bad things. And we haven't worried too much about design because after all, we're good guys and we do the design and so it's not a problem. The reason that the design has become a problem when it wasn't in the past is this design reuse. Taking blocks of information that you got off the internet or you got from your friend or you got maybe just recycled in the company, now all of a sudden you can inject things in the design. Meanwhile, injecting in the manufacturing process has become much more difficult because the feature sizes are very small and the chance of putting in a rogue uh, photo mask in the manufacturing process is much less. So we've shifted the risk, even though there's still risk at all stages of the supply chain, but the design has become much more vulnerable, whereas it wasn't that vulnerable in the past. Last question. Wouldn't a successful mitigation for a um, Internet of Things type of application, like for example, the lady was talking about home in terms of um, uh, um, stuff that she wants to put on the network is to create a separate network for just for the um, for the devices like you know the thermostat whatever is in the house just to have a separate network for that and then with a policy just allow it to access certain devices like for only the phone or only the um, um, whoever the, uh, uh, the vendor is, so that if there's any type of corruption in the chip trying to communicate anywhere else, the policy will stop it. So it could only go to, to designated places. I, I think you're absolutely right. This is what people are doing. This is the case I mentioned where you don't connect the braking system to the radio and so on. Mitigation through isolation is an approach, but it's not a guarantee. So uh, you can have a separate network for the important security things in your home, but that doesn't say you can perfectly isolate so that no one can hack into both networks, but it means that it's more difficult, and so maybe they go and hack into someone else's home, but if they really want to get in, then either of the networks is vulnerable, it's just that one is probably less vulnerable than the other. Okay. It seems to me that the 
let, let's look at the low-hanging fruit argument again. In the case of a camera, the problem is somebody compromising the sensor flow, not turning it into a springboard for something. In the case of a CPU chip, the obvious target is the microcode update mechanism, not playing with the chip circuit, because you can get all the mileage without any of the, of the effort. You don't have to make sure your doctored chip gets into the target. You just have to make sure it's a certain chip, and then the world is yours. The same problem occurs with IP at all levels. The danger is not corrupted IP and sabotaged IP as much as IP shortcomings. I'm talking about a slightly smaller scale problem of what happened to Apollo 13, where a blueprint change for one subsystem didn't catch up to another and created what turned out to be a catastrophic failure. If you are aware of a shortcoming in a piece of IP, for example, something widely used such as, well, not to mention names, but open SSL, uh, where everybody is cutting cost by not auditing the code, a great clear story of security clearance problems, he who knows about the bug is the, the one-eyed man in the land of the blind because you now have access to everything using that component. Yeah. And you know what its shortcoming is. So I think you'll hear more from the panel on this, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the IP, the reused blocks, the software you get, was, is more likely to cause a problem because it was not designed with the intent of being bulletproof against intrusion. So someone can get through that was not intended and it's more likely today that you have a problem because what you designed had vulnerabilities than it is because you designed in things that were actually dangerous. Either way, the end result can be the same. I think we're out of time. So thank you very much. My name is Zachary Goldman. I teach in the law school uh, on cybersecurity and national security issues, but uh, the most fun I have at NYU is when I'm here with my colleagues and friends in the engineering department where I'm a co-founder of NYU Center for Cybersecurity with Professor Carey, Professor Memon, uh, and our law school colleague, uh, Professor Sam Raskoff. Um, and it's now, at this point, trite to say that cybersecurity is a team sport, uh, but it's true. And listening to Wally's uh, uh, lecture this morning, one can't help uh, at least when you're when you're a lawyer like me, think about all of the complex regulatory issues, liability issues, contract issues that come up when thinking about IoT security, cloud security, and the like. And and just as we're constantly confronting novel technical challenges uh, in chip security, hardware security, the stuff that Ramesh focuses on, software security, and other dimensions of cybersecurity uh, from a technical perspective, uh, from a legal perspective, a lot of these are, are green fields, unplowed fields. And, and I expect many of you engineers, like it or not, will end up spending a lot of time with lawyers over the coming years when you're in the workforce trying to solve some of these really naughty challenges. And, and we, a lot of the work that we're doing here at NYU is meant to, to lay the groundwork for those holistic solutions to cybersecurity problems. Mm -hmm. Getting lawyers and engineers together in the classroom solving problems, working together on research projects. We're starting a new degree program that's a joint venture of the law school and the engineering school, a master's in cybersecurity that's designed again to get folks thinking about cybersecurity from a holistic perspective. Um, so the, the things that you heard discussed this morning, the technical challenges, the legal challenges, the commercial challenges, challenges of business incentives and the like, those are all questions on which we spend a lot of time here at NYU. So um, with that, I will hand things over to our, uh, our distinguished panel. Um, Brian Cohen, uh, who's a research staff member at the Institute for Defense Analyses, where he's been for 30 years, uh, focusing on a wide range of technology and business assessments for national security. Brian received a BS in electrical and computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon, an MS in electrical and computer engineering from UMass, and a PhD from Dartmouth's Thayer School. Michael Fritz is a senior fellow at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. He leads their efforts in the area of US government microelectronics focused on trusted electronics issues. He received a BS in physics from Lehigh and a PhD in physics from Brown. 
Finally, Mark Taranipur is the Intel Charles E. Young Preeminence Endowed Chair Professor in Cybersecurity and Co-Director of the Florida Institute for Cybersecurity Research at the University of Florida. Mark's current research interests include hardware security and trust, supply chain risk management and security, IoT security, and reliable circuit design. He's published 300, over 350 journal articles and refereed conference papers, eight books, 20 book chapters, and given more than 160 invited talks and keynote addresses, and holds two patents. Um, and finally, we're all familiar with today's distinguished lecturer, Wally Ryan. So please join me in thanking them and welcoming them all. All right. Well, uh, thanks for the uh, thanks for the kind introduction. It's uh, it's it's a difficult task for me to follow Wally. Wally, um, I've listened to Wally's uh, talk several times. He's an excellent uh, speaker. So all all I can tell is that I'll try my best. Um, so um, the topic of the discussion is on IoT uh, um, um, and cloud and the convergence of these. Security, of course, uh, and, and the title says a perfect storm. But the way I look at this is that, um, you know, cloud, of course, has been around for uh, a little more than a decade now, and IoT is catching up still, although it's not new, but uh, everyone expects by 2020 we're going to have million, billions and billions of IoT devices. But the two technologies, in my opinion, are part of a larger transformation, which uh, we call them digital transformation that are happening. And uh, you put them all together with the, um, the uh, trillion sensor that is upon us, the, uh, the, the cloud, the IoT, the artificial intelligence, the data, big data, and so on and so forth. That's what the, the digital transformation is. And it's really changing the manufacturing floors, manufacturing sectors, the healthcare industry, the energy, transportation, cities, operation centers, and more. And a lot of it also is the result of what uh, uh, Wally briefly talked about it, is this third party ecosystem that is the result of the globalization. And that is basically seen at every level we can imagine, whether it's at the chip level, all the way to software, to larger systems. And when you look at IoT, they're, they're fascinating in a sense that they're basically the one to connect the physical world to the digital world. So when you look at your secu security cameras, your temperature sensors, if you look at the a uh, lot of interesting applications that IoTs have, they're able to capture properties from the physical world and then translate it into the, the digital world, which is your cloud, and be able to help you uh, manage and analyze the, uh, the data that is being collected. The, um, you all know that Cisco has this big prediction of 2020 will have 50 billion devices. And I go back to Wally one more time. If you imagine only 1% of that 50 billion devices are either fake or, or clone, it, it scares the hell out of me because we're looking at billions of devices that are basically not trusted, monitoring you, your data, your personal privacy, and more. Now, the benefits is what's quite interesting. Let me challenge everybody. How many of you actually shop online? I'm assuming everybody. How many of you shop uh, uh, from Amazon? Many of you. And how many of you pay attention to the reviews? To the average ratings and reviews of the products that you buy. And how many of you believe that anything above four out of five must be a good product? Yes. But how many of you actually go and read, and how many of you actually go and read the ones that gave one? Have you ever seen any of them claim that there is a security problem with the product? That's very important, right? The average, unfortunately, that you see in the IoT devices, the smart devices that you actually buy, when it comes to security, is not as impactful as the convenience. When you see a score of 4.5 out of 5, it's because of the convenience and interesting features that the devices have. Even though I was at Amazon website and I was looking for a camera, 
And I noticed that somebody actually reported that he was easily able to actually hack into the device. For me, it was a no-no, but it's still more than hundreds of people bought it and they rave about it, that this is a great product with, with nice features, right? So there is that issue of you know, convenience is still being much more important than the security. And unfortunately, individuals uh, don't pay as much, as much attention to the security issue. So I can go on and on about the benefits of IoT, where there is a convenience for customers. You can actually monitor you know, security assets from here. I can check whether my garage door is open. I can actually check my security camera and see whether you know, uh, something happening at home. I can even check my... Um, um, uh, security system to see is on and off and so on and so forth, but they give you unique challenges. Very often you hear the difference between IoT devices and CPS and you know the, the, the old embedded systems. The IoTs give us unique properties and challenges. The first one, which is to me more important than anything else, is the heterogeneity, where before you had only the router and gateway to connect to internet, and they were all almost the same, but today any object can connect to internet. So the number of diverse devices that we actually have to deal with and establish some sort of a trustworthiness and security within those devices is extremely challenging. The impact of IoT devices also is uh, quite uh, fascinating when it comes to energy and smart cities, smart homes, uh, smart buildings, smart cars, smart anything, IoT devices play a big role into it. And uh, Wally mentioned quite a bit about the challenges and on security, I'm not going to mention uh, a long list of security challenges that I have in front of me, but certainly data integrity, um, data confidentiality, as well as user privacy uh, top my list. But unfortunately, IoTs are devices that can easily be uh, accessed uh, physically, and that brings me to tampering and other issues that have to be addressed as well. And uh, when it comes to security, very often motivation um, is a big question for us. Um, you know, when um, Willie uh, Sutton, who was a famous bank robber, um, robbed the bank and eventually was, he was captured, they asked him, so why do you rob the bank? And his answer was as if, like, you ask a, a smoker, why do you light a cigarette? Uh, his response was, because that's the, where the money is, right? So I think we're basically looking at IoT in a similar way, and some of some of the attacks that you hear, you kind of know that, okay, that's a target. A data means money. When you see Anton Bridge, when they get 80 million uh, um, you know, individuals' personal data, that's money because these guys sell that information. Uh, but when it comes to IoT, what is it? Um, well, IoT, as I said, certainly privacy is a major problem. But when you think about industrial IoTs, they can literally control your power grid system that's where the financial gain may be. And we heard about ransomware, for example, that uh, you know, uh, people look into trying to take control of your systems. IoT devices can do the same. If somebody basically I'm traveling and try to open up all of my home windows because they're controlled by the IoT and the smart devices, they certainly that person can get some ransom from me to be able to ensure that by the time I come back home, the doors are closed because otherwise I'll be losing a lot more than what I can pay him, right? So there is IoT, IoT could do as much harm as any other cybersecurity problems we have witnessed, uh, witnessed today. You also get very often questions, what do we do about it? I gave you the Amazon example just for one reason, because I think public need to ask more about security than just the convenience. We get a lot of these cool, smart devices with fancy features, but the reality is that we don't use them all. We like it to have them, but we don't use them all. And uh, Wally mentioned about keeping your password complex. That's where I start with. But there's a lot more to be done. Um, I'll hopefully, during the panel, I'll, I'll mention quite a few things that, as a user, we can ask for and we can do. That ends my, uh, my talk. Okay. So I'd like to start off and say I, I represent kind of the national security interest in these areas. There's been a long interest in, in hardware security for secure, secure communications, things like that. 
Um, but there's been a lot of change over the years. Um, increasingly, we see the hardware as the root of trust and that that pervades all kinds of things throughout the entire defense enterprise. IoT is an example. I work next to a building that was just put up a couple of years ago. That building has 50,000 industrial control systems in it. And um, the vast majority of those are highly vulnerable. Um, and this is a secure facility. So that's a, that's a terrible exposure. Um, over time, I think there's been a lot more sensitivity to why the actual chips matter. Um, Wally mentioned sort of the underlying sense that you know a compromise in a chip might impact a billion end products or a billion end users. But the other aspect for defense applications is you can't just go and send out a patch to the hardware. If you got a problem in the hardware, you got a problem because you got to go out and you got to replace physical hardware. So the consequences of a compromise can be even more egregious. But I, I got to tell you, I am, I'm heartened. I mean, there's certainly stories that we can say about compromises that have taken place. Um, but I'm, I'm really pleased to see that there's been a lot of movement um, in these areas. There's been a recognition that actually uh, the security at the hardware level matters. Uh, we hear talks from like Wally, and, and when it becomes monetized, when people are willing to pay for security, then you know it's kind of entered the mainstream. And now I think we're seeing that people actually recognize that it makes sense to spend money on hardware security in order to achieve our end goals. I'd also like to note that I, I think initially um, there was a lot of effort that I saw people spending on um, can we test in using a sort of product level verification and validation? Can we test in security? Well, you know, in, in the quality field, we learned in the 60s and into the 70s that it made no sense to test in quality. You weren't going to get high levels of quality by testing it in. What you needed to do was you needed to build it in. So I think we've started to recognize that. The, you know, in the software area, we certainly have recognized that in order to get security, in order to get assurance, we have to build it in. And now I think we're seeing that in hardware and best practices, the use of tools um, like, uh, like Wally mentions, this is gonna make a huge difference in the security of the hardware products. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is, um, really, this is not like a hardware problem. There's no, there's no cybersecurity problem with a chip. There's a cybersecurity problem with our systems and our missions. So it makes little sense to focus narrowly on a chip. What we need to do is take a more holistic approach. We gotta worry about the chip that is part of a system, and it operates with firmware, and it operates with software and it operates with the architecture of that system. In order to understand and manage uh, those issues with the chip, we have to understand that whole problem. So that being said, I'd, I'd like to say a few words about where the Department of Defense has come and where it seems to be heading. In 2003, the department was very concerned about chips being manufactured offshore. So it set up something called the Trusted Foundry Program, which was a, a public-private partnership with, which was uh, uh, set up with what was then IBM. Um, it it uh, established a supply chain that included design, uh, of course, fabrication, but also test and packaging. Um, but about three years ago, uh, Global Foundries, which is owned by Abu Dhabi, um, actually sought to purchase IBM Microelectronics, which set off a flurry of panic throughout the government you would not believe. And in the end, uh, uh, Global Foundries was able to come to very agreeable terms with the government. They set up a wholly owned subsidiary. But the plain fact is, is that the world has changed. Um, the government has to expect that sort of the 
base level of technology and products in IT and in electronics is going to come from a global commercial base. And we're going to have to deal with that. And so we're going to end up, we're going to have products which come from overseas. We're going to have products which are basically commercial. These products aren't necessarily going to have the security properties that the government might want. So what can you do? So um, the government started just this fiscal year a new program called Trusted and Assured Microelectronics. Um, it's $70 million a year. Um, and the investment is to try and get away from having to have like a domestic manufacturer or a domestic design house where only good people are going to do the design and manufacturing and hope that that's going to fix the problem. In fact, the, the program's named Trusted and Assured Microelectronics with the idea that trust has to do with confidence that you have, that the people, that the facilities, that the processes are, are not going to be compromised and therefore you get a good product out. But, you know, people are people. People sometimes make mistakes. They might leave, you know, some code open or accidentally leave a back door in a product. This stuff happens. So the program is actually called Trusted and Assured. So the assured part is moving towards the idea that the real problem is we want to have confidence that a product is free of vulnerabilities. So there's a lot of technical work that's going on. There's uh, verification and validation. And I'm actually very heartened to hear talks like Wally, to hear lots of ongoing research that we're, we're going to be able to make technical progress against these problems. Uh, we'll be able to, what I say, raise all ships. It's not just that the government chips are going to get better, but that all the chips that are available throughout industry, including IoT and in used in cloud security, that we'll be able to improve the security. And actually, that'll benefit all of society in addition to government. So thank you. Just this a little bit. Uh, testing, can everybody hear me? I can probably reach the audience without the mic, but anyway, that's what my wife says. So I, have a, I guess I have a decent out outdoor voice. Uh, my name is Mike Fritzi, and I am a uh, senior fellow at the Potomac Institute uh, for Policy Studies. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit uh, think tank, uh, S&T think tank in, in Washington. And uh, uh, we, we, this is one of the areas that I particularly was, uh, was hired to uh, go into a lot more depth in which is the hardware security area in government policy. So I'll just make a few brief remarks on, on uh, government policy. Uh, Brian touched on some of them, but I'll, I'll expand a little bit on what Brian said on what the government has done with respect to hardware security uh, over the last, let's say, decade uh, or so. I just wanted to start by thanking Ramesh for the uh, invitation to this event. Um, I was intrigued not just by the panelists, but also by the diverse nature of the audience. So if you'll bear with me, I'd like to find out a little bit about the diversity of the people that are here. So uh, raise your hand if you're uh, double E, if your background is double E. Good. So it's less than half. Fantastic. So that means more than half of the people are not double E, which is exciting. So uh, uh, how many people are from the financial world? Good. What about the legal? What about the legal world? Good. I'm very happy to see this uh, because this, this is too important for, uh, for one discipline uh, to address. I think people have gotten that message, right, that there will be a convergence of, of uh, legal and, and uh, financial aspects of this uh, problem as well. Um, so to make sure that we have enough time for the, the panel discussion, which is probably the most interesting, I'll just make a few brief remarks on, on government policy. Um, the government has appreciated for some time that hardware security is important. Right? It's just, it's just an, an important thing to make sure that you have uh, secure hardware. And so they've, they've implemented some policies over the years to do that. One of the first approaches was to have their own fab. Right? So the government had their own fab at Fort Meade, and uh, they built all kinds of secure chips and, and behind the wire, and you know, people had security clearances, and people knew that it was a, a secure product. And that worked for a while. It just got increasingly uh, costly and difficult right? as, as technology became more difficult. 
So that was that was one solution in policy history. That was replaced by what's called the Trusted Foundry Program, which uh, which Brian uh, mentioned. When it was realized the government couldn't maintain its own state-of-the-art fab, what they did was they made a uh, an agreement, or actually came out as a solicitation to U.S. Uh, uh, fab vendors that said, you know, we would like to bid for a commercial fab uh, uh, company. I guess at that time it was Intel and IBM, right? That were the people that uh, uh, that could do that, and we'd like to bid for a secure protocol, so people can produce parts for the government, and they'll they'll follow a, a prescribed protocol for security. And that was what's called the Trusted Foundry Program, or managed by the Trusted Access Program Office, or TAPO uh, for short. And that was in agreement. I guess it lasted about ten years, right? Roughly roughly ten years. Uh, yeah, right. So less than 12, 12 years. And it, w it was reasonably good. There was an agreement with IBM Microelectronics, and the government got secure parts. They got a portfolio of secure parts. There was provenance. There was some sort of handling history, at least on the fab part. Uh, and that worked really well until the sale that Brian mentioned, right? Because business reasons. IBM is a big company. They do many things. Microelectronics is not the primary interest of IBM. So they sold the microelectronics unit. It was a business decision. And they sold it to a foreign owned company. And as Brian said, you can't imagine, because we were in the vortex, right? We were sort of in the trenches at the time. It was like chickens with their heads cut off, running around. What do we do? We can't get the parts. We've tested these for years, and now we can't get them anymore. We'll have to go to China or something. Really frightening. It was really frightening. So that was a, that was a lesson that, in my mind at least, access is even the most important thing. You need security. Of course you need security. But you need access. And if you're a small customer like the government, you need to make sure that you have an access plan so that you can actually even physically get the parts you need. Because the giant vendors are not interested in selling a few thousand parts. They want to send millions of parts. So this uh, one point I wanted to make is the policy Im uh, implication of that was the, was the Trusted Foundry program. Right now, the government has continued its contract. Uh, it's novated its contract with IBM to Global Foundries. And so the old IBM fabs in New York are still run by Global Foundries. They have a state-of-the-art fab up in Malta, and there is there is a thank you very much. There is a, a, a relationship there. Um, I wanted to say two uh, two or three other quick points, and I probably can do these in one minute. The other is the government has a trusted, a certified trusted supplier program. Does this cover all suppliers? No, it covers an important subset of suppliers that have agreed to secure protocols. So if you're really interested in high security and you're a government contractor, you can go to the trusted uh, supplier list and you can use someone that's been vetted. Is that means there's zero risk? Of course not. Does it mean there's reduced risk? Yes. So I also wanted to mention the trusted supplier program as, as one uh, policy response of the government. And finally, we all heard about the bad legacy problem of old parts, right, that go in and people are desperate and they'll buy from anywhere. And so the government has its own legacy fab uh, in, in uh, Sacramento in California that builds secure versions of legacy parts. And the way they do that is they license the old IP. They license the old process IP. And that, that is intended to put a dent in the sustainment issues of getting, getting bad parts in. So I wanted to leave you with one final thought, which is a result of a lot of studies the government has done. And that's going forward. How should we go forward? Uh, I think a lot of the conclusions from the studies that have been done have been that the government needs to work together more, all the different equities, not just defense. There's a lot of equities that, that uh, care about secure microelectronics. That even includes secure infrastructure and things like that. We need to work together on a, on a national strategy for, for secure hardware. And that's something that a lot of the studies that I've either participated in or, or listened to have, have come to a conclusion that that's actually very important. So I wanted to leave you with that thought. Of, of having a more national strategy on this level because it's it's really that important for both the industry, not only for security, but also for economic health. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for those remarks. Uh, to, so I have a couple of questions to kick off. Uh, one, open source software, how does that uh, fit into the cheap and secure IoT ecosystems, as well as open source hardware. How do they all fit in, sir? Oh, OK. OK, uh, well, um, uh, I'm, I, I must say I'm not a, uh, I'm not a software, software security expert, but um, the reality is that we are, are, you know, if you look at an airplane today, we're looking at millions and millions and millions of line of code. And 
one of the big challenges that we have is um, the software legacy and um, verifying the integrity of the software unfortunately continues to be a major problem. Now your question in terms of the relationship between software and IoTs, of course that's uh, some of it has to do with the IoT device itself and some of it basically software that we have to deal with at the at the cloud, but at the IoT level, to me, one of the major problems uh, 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 from software actually goes into the firmware and firmware security. And getting access to firmware and uh, applying uh, uh, something malicious to it, certainly a major concern. And those are all open res uh, research areas at this point. Open source hardware? Sorry, I also mentioned it. Yeah, that uh, Bali mentioned that. That to me is a is 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 probably a bigger problem. And the reason I say bigger problem is because because the topic is just such a new new problem to look into, right? Um, uh, there is a lot of uh, IPs out there. Um, if you go to opencores.org, you actually can find ten different. Maybe I'm underestimating here. The a lot more number of, say, implementation of an AES circuit, so AES being at uh, advanced encryption uh, so standard, and uh, which you uh, uh, would be surprised to know that we ran a test, uh, developed a series of tools to be able to identify vulnerabilities in the hardware IP, and uh, we found any one of them that we tested out to be vulnerable to some attacks. And I'm talking about low-hanging fruits, easy flaws and unintentional flaws in the circuitry that allow you to somehow get access to the key, whether it's through side channel attack or information flow leakage and so on and so forth. So continues to be a big problem. Um, again, while you mentioned that the reason that they go to some of these open um, IP uh, 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 cores is that they're free, they're cheap. And considering the fact that today's system on the chips, we have 50, 60, 70 of these IP cores. So the companies are pushed toward getting access to some of these low cost um, IPs. So they continue to be a problem. The one thing I want to mention is that uh, when we do research in this domain, we don't necessarily always try to look for bad guy. A lot of sim security issues are just there not because a bad guy designed it that way, just because the designer did not know those could potentially cause a security problem. So automation would be key to address some of that, which again, Wally has uh, been talking about it and Mentor is leading some of that. So uh, DOD implications of open source uh, hardware, do you want to so, well, there's kind of two of us, but I, I don't mind saying a, a couple of words. I mean, obviously, um, th there's, a, there's a push toward using more modularity, right, in order to upgrade, because par part of the DoD problem is they have these big complex systems that need to be upgraded periodically, and if it isn't modular, you're completely beholden to the original contractor, right? And if it's modular, you can just upgrade. So there's a role for open source in, in, in getting to implement modularity. The problem is just handling the security vulnerabilities. So I think, I think there will be a move toward trying to embrace more open source, and we need to deal with the security implications of that. I don't think it will be dismissed out of hand because of security, just because it's just so important as part of a modular approach. So uh, let me comment uh, uh, to further what uh, Michael said. Um, you know, in the software area, actually, there are a lot of tools out there that do software assurance. They will go to these large databases, vulnerability data databases of the common weaknesses and common vulnerabilities. And these tools will scan through open source code, and they'll generate reports on vulnerabilities that are found. Um, Right now, we don't really have that on the, on the chip, the hardware side. So that, that's a weakness that we have right now, but in another sense, it's, a, it's an opportunity for there to be further research to define what it means to have a hardware vulnerability and to be able to support tools that actually can analyze things like open cores and report to us where these vulnerabilities are. So if any of you have thoughts, I mean, this is a ripe area for research. So uh, I just want to frame this question slightly differently. So we've been talking about vulnerabilities in hardware. Uh, 
Is there a move or is there an effort where hardware can be used to patch vulnerabilities or defend against vulnerabilities in software? Uh, does anybody want to take? Uh, I can I can elaborate on that. I think your question is quite timely, Ramesh, because uh, DARPA just came out with a program called SIT, S S I T H, and SIT program is specifically designed to be able to address a huge number of software vulnerabilities that exist in some of the well-known databases, as Brian mentioned, such as the CWE by MITRE or um, uh, National Vulnerability Database by, by NIST. And the idea behind it is that these 2,000 or 3,000 software vulnerabilities, many of them are potentially result of hardware vulnerabilities. And by the time you put one software patch, then attacker finds a different way by using the same vulnerability to get into the system and be able to attack it. And so there are some efforts, I think uh, uh, there are good number of researchers also have been looking into this, what I like to call them you know, hardware for software. Very often in the past, what we did, um, we designed the hardware without thinking about vulnerabilities and securities, and we left it up there to the software engineers and and and, and network uh, network uh, security folks to be able to patch everything that potentially come from the hardware. Um, um, Ramesh himself has done a great deal of work in this domain. We've done a lot of work that we basically try to address some of the issues at the low level, which is the hardware, to be able to address the DDoS, the distributed denial of service type attacks, malware, or even ransomware, where you could basically do much more effectively at the hardware level. After all, any of these attacks require execution at the microprocessor level. And if you could design microprocessors with certain security intelligence in mind, you may be able to predict them much more effectively than just relying at the higher level of the abstract and go to software level to be to be able to do it. Don't forget that the best approaches out there to be able to take your malware is actually as effective as 70%. So you do need to be able now to for rely uh, more on hardware to be able to help you out to detect some of the more uh, subtle type attacks that actually happen at the software level. So Wally, I have a quick follow-on question uh, for you. Uh, if these electronic products uh, are purchased from a well-known uh, supplier, for example. You mentioned this. Uh, is it reasonably safe that we don't have to worry about the th systems that come out of the, such a uh, supply chain? In a word, no. Uh, the, the fact is that everyone is vulnerable. I do think that you do gain some protection by virtue of going with reputable, well-known suppliers. But no, but no one is immune from leakage into their systems from uh, software or hardware that is vulnerable to attack by a third party. And so uh, being wary is the best approach. So uh, we have a question uh, online. So. Do companies like Mentor and other design companies uh, support uh, IP encryption? Uh, are there any standardizations that are in this direction? And uh, how would you bring that into the design flows? So? Yes, yeah, so there, there are several levels where encryption can provide protection. Uh, first of all, design data that travels around the world that uh, is used in designing chips uh, is all encrypted as a matter of routine with uh, standard uh, forms of encryption. In addition, the blocks of reused design information typically are made available in encrypted form, and so that uh, at least gives you one layer of protection. It's not an absolute protection, and uh, uh, both the good guys and the bad guys can encrypt their IP, so just because it's encrypted doesn't mean it's safe, but it is uh, something that the design community uses, something that the major electronic design automation companies take seriously. And I would note that just to support our customers, thousands of customers around the world who do design, the only way that they will trust our support 
is if the information is transmitted in a secure manner, which frequently involves even more than just encryption. Yeah. Uh. So, so I'd like to also uh, comment that this whole thing about encryption, um, this is a system engineering problem that um, today we've moved a lot towards actually using firmware um, to allow us to compensate when there are flaws in our products, we can send out firmware patches. But you know, um, a beautiful feature in one person's eyes is a fatal security flaw in another person's eyes. And we have a lot of work to do in order to be able to really manage the security of these firmware patches when they're sent out to our products. Um, we have to be able to maintain a key infrastructure and we have to make we have to make sure that when these um, patches are sent out, that these are patches that are properly vetted and don't, don't actually expose end users to real security problems. And this has been happening um, with some really egregious examples. There was a, a phone example uh, where some software called AdUps was sending out firmware patches to phones. And the firmware patches actually then started having the phones send back all your personal information to an unnamed country. Um, so that's that's a terrible exposure. So, so uh, yeah, okay. relies on a standard and, and Wally in his presentation mentioned one of those. Um, IEEE actually has an, a standard for what they call them IP encryption. Uh, I believe it's called uh, 1735. Um, um, I just want to caution everybody. We actually, a team at the University of Florida just broke into that standard. And the reason is um, um, I, I personally always like NIST model, and NIST basically does a good job of, of uh, you know, AES and DES over the years, they've done a great job of developing these standards where they allow academic researchers to also beat the hell out of these selected uh, uh, algorithms and then give them enough time so that they can be examined. Unfortunately, this standard did not do that, even though we have some of the most expert individual uh, uh, part of the team, but but the team actually was able to break into it. We automated the entire process, and the publication will come out uh, very soon on this. So our standards are great, but the method of putting the standards, I think, have to be revisited from what we've done in the past, because we're talking about security. And I mentioned this. Once you say, I develop something that is secure, remember, a lot of antennas are going up. A lot of researchers are going after it because they think that there is no such thing as called secure and they're going to go after it and I think that was something we got interested in over a period of six months the team was able to break into the standard. So uh, I have a few more questions but before I do I, I want to see if you have any more questions for the panel or think about it while I go with one or two more questions. I see, yeah. Um, so there was a very good point that security is something that has to be built in, you can't test for it. The problem is that as a consumer of a device, we can't know what's been built in. We can only know what we can test for. So how as consumers can we have confidence that the people building our devices have built in security? So um, the government's been very interested in this. So. Um, in the past, the government has approached cybersecurity in a way that basically says it's going to um, take 800 different controls and put it on a contract, and that's what a defense contractor has to do. Um, right now, people are looking at whether you can actually ask a company to attest to the types of practices it uses. And so if you, if you ask a company, um, you know, what sort of... Uh, flows and verification and validation do you do as part of developing your product, you'll often find that companies that are good are actually proud of what they do because that makes their products better. So I'm a big fan of, you know, trying to get more transparency there um, and asking the right questions. But um, often when you're talking about commercial products, you have no insight 
into what was used to develop or produce that product, and you're often having to accept it at face level. In which case, you know, I, I agree with you, it's a bit of a quandary, and you can only do so much to build up confidence there's, there's, that there's not a problem with that product. So before you pick up, uh, I just want to follow on with the same question. Underwriters Labs, any, uh, something like that? Uh, Michael, would you like to? Yeah, I'll have a comment on that. I just wanted to, just while the thread is clear in my mind from what Brian just said, uh, I wanted to comment on that. And I'll give you one example where, where you can't know or where you should know. Uh, brokers, we all know that brokers can be risky, right? Because they source parts from everywhere, often old parts. So we've had a number of workshops, right, and, and that looked at invited brokers. And there's a huge difference in what, how brokers vet their parts. Some have no vetting at all, and others have electron microscopes and detailed side channel testing, and they capture parts. Now, does that mean they're totally secure? No, it doesn't. Does that mean they should get a better rating? Yes, it does. But right now, there isn't a formalism to actually implement that. And I was impressed with, with the rigor with which some brokers approach their parts. And which brings me to the, to the question about UL. So in some of the meetings that I've been to, uh, it turns out underwriter laboratories, I remember as a kid, right, you'd go to your, your, your lamp and it was UL certified, you wouldn't electrocute yourself, right? So you had some confidence that it was safe for kids to play around and stuff like that. Well, they're actually going into certifying hardware security and some aspects of software security in some key market segments like medical, like industrial controls. I think that's fascinating and that's a sign of the future. Yeah, if I, a very short answer here as well. I think the answer to your question is automation, automation, automation. Because at the end of the day, you can't have a group of good guys as white hackers to look into these devices and then write down certain reports, right? So um, um, based on what uh, Mike just said, you, um, whether it's UL, I mean, think about it. You, you, when you develop a new medicine, you send them to FDA for approval and FDA does all sorts of analysis of your data and uh, you know all of that and then try to say, well, you know what, this actually works for, for good enough for patients and then release them, right? I do think that uh, when it comes to IoT devices and uh, smart devices, we need something like this, whether it's UL or any unbiased and uh, you know an entity to be able to automatically, as, as at least against what we call them known attacks or low-hanging fruits, to be able to run those tests and provide a report. And uh, the example of Amazon again: if you're getting those devices, even though when it comes to features they're great, but what if you also get a report? that comes with it, and you as a cons consumer have the right to read that report and make the decision whether you want to take that risk of buying this device given the report that you're reading, right, or, or not. And I think automation can only way make it happen, otherwise manual processes are not going to address the problem, especially given the large number of and diversity of the IoT devices that we have to deal with. Wally? that hasn't been mentioned, one of the benefits of buying from reliable suppliers uh, is that in design there is something called formal methods. And formal methods are basically mathematical proofs of the existence of some particularly identifiable Trojan or other, uh, other artifact in a design. And so uh, formal methods can be used to identify known uh, viruses, Trojans, other things in the chip, and that is a first line of security. The problem is, what about the unknown? And the shelf life of a virus or Trojan is very short, so the, the criminal people who get hold of these sell them very quickly because otherwise they'll be discovered and they won't have any value. But governments who engage in this kind of activity can afford to leave them on the shelf and when they are injected, they're not identifiable by formal methods, and that's the real challenge ahead. You can always keep a library of all the ones you know, but that doesn't include all the ones you don't know. Any more? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I am talking from the entrepreneur and new startups, you know, and the industry. When you said that, you know, you need such high standards, so it's become very difficult for startups to sell to you know uh, industry and you know is there any way we can create something which becomes a catalyst for the startups because they are creating new technologies new products which may be useful to the industry but because of the requirements of such stringent requirements they are not able even able to come to that level and the startup ultimately has to die 
So, you know, we need to create something for them where, you know, this, their products in technology products can be accepted, tested by someone and then, you know, uh, industry has to look at them because, you know, otherwise there may be some interesting technologies but we just ignore them. Regulation, I think is the question, right? Any, is so, there too so, much so um, there is often a lot of burden that the government places on companies to deal with things like cybersecurity. And if you have to implement 800 controls when you just want to demonstrate some interesting technical performance result, that can be a total buzzkill, right? Um, so I think there is a place for balancing all these requirements. And if you're demonstrating sort of a new technical capability, you shouldn't have to carry all the baggage necessary to achieve very high levels of cybersecurity in a deployed system. There should be a process whereby as you move along and you go from a concept into starting to move into a product, you can take the maturity of the cybersecurity along that same route in a balanced and appropriate manner. Wally, uh, this is, uh, I think we have one okay. last comment on regulation and uh, cybersecurity in general. Well, I'm not a big fan of regulation in <laughs> general. I just wanted to get that in. <laughs> so uh, I, I think standardization, the evolution of standards, particularly uh, through uh, consortia and uh, other bodies, uh, tend to be the most effective because you can have interactive interchange about the trade-offs that Brian's talking about, the cost versus the benefit. And so, in general, regulations tend to be very staid, they're hard to keep current, and they're also, they put a cost burden and other uh, performance burden on products that uh, may not need them, and so better to standardize than to regulate. Uh, uh, regulation versus best practices, I think you hear about it quite often. I think best practices are the best approach to do it. To answer your question about cost, uh, yeah, there's no question that security comes with the cost, but how much, I throw a term at you, just enough security, right? And just enough security to me uh, means uh, why not just addressing the low-hanging fruits? Why would you leave our telnet port open? We've known that for 20 years that this is a vulnerability, but it's still some of the products come out with that. And those, those solutions are out there, and, and nobody has to pay for it except a little bit of a you know, minor change in the design. Uh, but it, I can assure you it won't be exp expensive. So just enough security may be a solution to go. In other words, address 95% of all of the known ones as much as you can, and then leave the unknown ones right out there. And you know, unknown ones are extremely difficult to to detect. And uh, some some of us who've been in in this domain for years and years and years are still are scratching our head how we'd be able to address them, and that's going to cost significantly if anybody wants to come up with a solution for that. So I think I'll just say something very, very briefly. So, and the government has started to think about these things. So, so with the standards that Wally was mentioning, there, there should be a sliding scale, right? Because there are some things that are not critical and other things that are important. And then there's life, there's life maintenance things. So there needs to be a sliding scale to, so you know how much is enough because how much is enough depends on the application. So there has to be a sliding scale in those standards. But I'm a fan, and the government is thinking about this too, of having a, a formal standards uh, in, for trust and security. So with that, uh, thank you to the panel. And uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that was really an illuminating uh, panel, and I guess we can sleep easy, not worrying about the storm that might come our way. But thank you so much to Wally and the panelists, uh, Mark, uh, Mike, and Brian. Uh, and uh, so an event like this takes a lot of time and effort to organize, and uh, I would like to thank the Enterprise uh, Tannen Online Learning Team, uh, Myra, Marlene, Jay, John, Lisa, 
Luke, Tamika, Mark, Sebastian, and Ralph, uh, thank you so much for the hard work you put into this. <laughs> uh, thank you for our student workers, uh, Minakshi, Siddhant, Iva, Siddharth, Ayushi, Kashurga, Impreet, Pia, and Mar Maria. Uh, th uh, thanks to Elaine, who really headed the whole effort and organized the event. <laughs> and uh, uh, thanks to Kathleen Hamilton and Sheldon and Will from the media team, and then uh, Tara from NYU Center for Cybersecurity. Thank you all. <laughs>